It is my great pleasure to invite our distinguished panelists to join me on stage for this very exciting session, um, the operator CEO session discussing wholesaling fiber as a driver of business success. So let me ask Sean Atkinson, CEO of Syro, Elisabetta Ripa, CEO of Open Fiber, Uwe Alm, CEO of Telia Scanova, Mike McThai, Chairman of OpenReach, and last but not least, Greg Mesh, the CEO of City Fiber, to join me here on stage. <coughs> I think one important thing that is common in all of the operators who are present with their business leaders um, here today is that they're all having a very important wholesale business when it comes to fiber, even though their backgrounds and business models uh, might be different. Um, we will start with the opening statements um, of our CEOs here, and I would like to first invite Sean um, to actually deliver his opening statement with a few slides. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, we'll try and, as I say, get you out of the post-lunch lull. Um, get this. So, <coughs> I'm here to just kind of very briefly introduce you to Syro. Syro is a new entrant into the Irish market, and you heard um, maybe before lunch, if you were here, Ireland's just made it into the uh, panorama uh, for fibre to the home. Something we're, we're delighted that we're getting there, but in, in early days, uh, and a lot more work to do. So, <coughs> just a bit of background about Ireland, um, that uh, just to just sort of set the scene. If you think about the telecoms, Ireland is a very low uh, population density, so there's uh, a lot of, about four and a half million people, but spread across a large area. So in terms of the, 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 the density there, and population rolling out fiber, it's a challenging um, a market. We don't have a lot of high-rise MDUs, and uh, you know, so it's, it's a particularly challenging market. But I suppose the feature of the market over the last number of years, um, before Sawyer was, was sort of born, was particularly low investment. The, the incumbent operator had been through a lot of sort of financial difficulties post privatization. So there had been, I would say, significant underinvestment in the sector that uh, resulted in, I'd say, Ireland lagging behind in the broadband stakes. And you can see the, some of the statistics there. Um, and this is where we are today that we even, you know, 30% of fixed broadband connections are less than 30 megabits per second. And, and, and that's today. The economy in Ireland is a small open economy, um, part of the EU, obviously. Uh, the digital economy is very important. It's 6%, projected to grow up to 10%. Um, but even within that, though, the challenges are you know, the SMEs, which is obviously critical to sort of job creation, particularly outside of the cities, which is part of what Syro is about. Uh, you know, 80% can't process online payments. Um, you know, the, the, the broadband is, 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 hasn't sort of reached out to the digital agenda, hasn't really reached out into uh, outside the cities. So why Syro, right? So Syro is was created, was launched in 2015. Um, it's a joint venture, 50% uh, owned by the electricity company, uh, the, the national utility company, ESB, and by Vodafone. Um, we're the first nationwide rollout of fibre to the home in Ireland. Uh, and we have our phase one targets, which is to get to 25% of, the, of the, uh, the homes, which is about half a million homes. And we've done that across 50 towns, as you can see them there in the map, spread, spread across Ireland, focusing primarily outside the major cities where there is competition between the incumbent and between the cable operator uh, in the markets. But the regional towns in Ireland were particularly poorly served by broadband, and that was the opportunity that Syro saw. And what we are is we're an open access network provider. So just a bit of background, I think everybody in the room will know about Vodafone, but you can see obviously it's now investing in fixed networks across the 17 markets as well as what it's doing in the, in, in the mobile sector. But the, the, why ESB? This was the ESB's idea initially. And as a utility company, they looked and said, obviously, as a utility company, we have a connection to every home in Ireland. There is a need for um, broadband in Ireland. And can we do something? Can we actually put fiber optic network onto the uh, overhead lines and into the ducts and then use those um, pathways to get the last mile and the access fiber network built? And that was what uh, uh, sort of Syro was born out of, was that vision by ESB to say, can we actually solve this problem? Um, can we make a good commercial return on it? Is it a good business model? Uh, and can we do actually do something in terms of social uh, um, responsibility and uh, sort of betterment of, of, of Ireland? <coughs> and this is how we do it. It's no real secret in here. Obviously, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the top, everybody familiar with what 
the network looks like um, in terms of the core network, reasonably well served, but the last mile. So, Syro, what we do is rather than digging in everywhere to put the fibre in the ground, we try and use the existing infrastructure. So we go down to the, the local exchange, we start at a substation, and we follow the pathways into the homes using the, the street furniture and the overhead and underground networks as they are. So that's probably really the, you know, the innovative, and we'll hear some more later on um, about that. The, the innovative feature of, of, of Syro is to, to drive that um, uh, build that out over the uh, electrical network. So really, I'll draw up to conclusion now. So Syro, just uh, put it in your mind as to what it is. We're Ireland's first 100% fibre to the home network. We have a wholesale business model. We're an open access, non-discriminatory um, provider. So we have, um, I think, nine retailers on our network at this stage, varying in sizes from a couple of the larger retailers you'd be familiar with, down to, to, to local providers. As I say, it's an innovative model. And we're really transforming Ireland's telecoms landscape. And I think you know, we've probably changed the conversation, even since Syro um, was conceived of, um, if there is anyone out there familiar with the, the Irish uh, market, it's forced others to move. You know, we've now, as I say, we've, you know, we've, we've got the regulator that now has fibre to the home as a category uh, in his quarterly report. Previously, when Syro was born, there was only uh, another category which captured everything else, so f fibre to the home didn't have its own category. That's now reversed, and you know we were delighted today that you know fibre to the home is now on the panorama here with the, with the council, uh, and it's very much around that sort of obviously future proofing, and everybody's familiar with the um, the you know the, the the vision that was painted here over the last couple of days of a ubiquitous fibre network, and in Syro we're very much working towards that in Ireland. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, next up, I would like to invite Elisabetta Ripa to make her opening statement. Um, as you've all seen today morning, Open Fiber has won the Operator FTTH Award for 2018. So we're all very curious to hear your story. Yes, thank you. And I'm really proud for the award, uh, also because we are a young company born last year, one year ago, and after one year we achieved such important results that we are very keen and proud to share with you. But I'm even more uh, proud and interest to share with you the business model that Open Fiber Select, uh, the wholesale only business model. And why we have selected this approach with reference to a country that uh, still is not benefiting from the fully deployment of uh, broadband and is, lucky, uh, is uh, well behind when compared in terms of uh, broadband penetration with uh, European average. So we thought there was room for improvement in our country. We thought there was the room for having a new approach to the development of this important technology. I heard this morning that we all share the fact that we need uh, FTTH, we need a huge <coughs> capacity and speed in order to allow and, and enable the digital revolution. And we think that the economics of the FTTH consists basically in a large fix and sum cost. And um, passing home, but with uh, definitely a comparatively low cost when you have to add a marginal customers and when you have to connect other home at your infrastructure. So the most cost effective answer to this uh, business we think is the wholesale model that allow us basically to reap the economics of scales that the business needs, but also to share with uh, uh, many operators the burden of the investment that is requiring. To that extent, I mean, we are in a very good position because Open Fiber has no legacy network, so we can address this point without any kinds of conflict of interest. And we are, can uh, uh, facilitate uh, the development of uh, telco operators, but also the entrance of new players in the telco space. And that's exactly the main purpose of our open platform that is delivering not only passive infrastructure 
and passive uh, uh, network, but also active solution in order to accommodate the development of new players in the telco space. After one year, uh, as I mentioned, we reached basically 2.5 million uh, home uh, connected. So quite an important numbers if compared with the numbers of months that we had in terms of uh, uh, rollout. We leverage, of course, on the network that we receive from the acquisition of MetroWeb. We are now covering 13 cities uh, in our country. And we are hosting, after less than six months of opening at the commercial activities, 250,000 customers. So a small numbers in comparison with the huge numbers of, uh, of course, uh, the incumbents <coughs> of the telco operators. But I think it's a good start in order to demonstrate that there is the room and the opportunity for growing uh, with this model in our country, but also in the European space. Why we think that uh, is interesting, this model? Because we have to roll out, basically, in the next uh, uh, five years, a network to provide services to more than 9.3 million um, households. And uh, in order to do that, we have to invest something around 3.9 billion euros. And this is going to be dedicated to the coverage of uh, more or less 270 cities, large cities, when there is, uh, where there is room for competition. But we don't want to limit this kind of rollout only to the uh, competitive areas, because we think that uh, Italy deserves a newly and future-proof infrastructure also to reduce the digital divide that historically has been a big issue for our country in terms of uh, um, difficult in deployment uh, productivity, difficult in bridging the gap with the digital agenda, difficult also in increase, uh, let's say, our ability to attract also with tourism or without any kinds of uh, economical activities, uh, investments in, uh, in our space. So we want to habilitate and facilitate the deployment also in the areas where there is no sustainability for a private operator. And in order to do that, we have participated to a specific auction, auction that has been uh, uh, launched by uh, the uh, public sector in order to build and manage for 20 years an infrastructure focused on the so-called failures, uh, market failures area. We won two of these tenders and we are in the progress of starting the rollout of 9.6 million of home connected, receiving in order to perform this task uh, roughly 1.5 billion euros of public contribution. So we are going to share the investment. We have a really ambitious uh, plan, but we think that uh, uh, this is going to be feasible using as much as possible or reusing as much as possible the infrastructure and pretty much similar to the model that we heard just before my talk, uh, we are going to leverage on the infrastructure of all the utilities that we will find in uh, the areas where we are going to deploy the network. But mostly we are going to leverage on the power, power electrical lines uh, thanks to the fact that we can uh, uh, have some synergies with our shareholders, uh, Enel, that is the power incumbent in our country. So we will speed up the rollout thanks to that. We will use uh, all the infrastructure that we'll find in order to achieve that. And we will go very uh, quickly in terms of rollout in the metropolitan areas in order to, let me say, fill the gaps of coverage and fill the gap of uh, uh, opportunities that we think is there in the market. After one year of uh, existence of open fiber, the first result was really evident in terms of market growth. Italy fixed line business uh, has uh, performed uh, uh, def definitely a declining trend for more than 10 years. And in 2017, for the first time, uh, 
this trend reverted with an increase of 1.5%, still a small number, but an inversion of the direction. And I think that was the result of uh, the existence of uh, open fiber in the market. And we think there is still uh, room for improvement, considering that, again, we are a mobile-only market where more than 33% uh, of, of households are mobile-only players or mobile-only customers, but not because they are deciding to be a mobile-only customers, but be because there is no alternatives, because the uh, quality that are receiving in the broadband is very poor. So moving back to the, the issue or the topics of this uh, section, is uh, an all-sale-only model a successful approach? I think is uh, the case also because investors are looking at this model very, very positively. And this because probably is similar to the ones of the utilities that they know very well, but also because this model is reducing the volatility that uh, a vertically integration operators traditionally have in a competitive environment. So to, to recap and go into the point and then uh, discuss, uh, we are more than open to discuss our approach, we think that this model is good for the market and is good for the industry because it's the only one that is able to allow economy of scale. It's the only one that could uh, attract uh, financial uh, investments in the dimension and in the sites that we need in order to develop the network. And it is also the only one that will allow competition, not on uh, connectivity, that by the way we have to say it's now a commodity, but will allow competition on services and this is going to be beneficial for the market and for the industry. And we also think that through this model we can uh, built an infrastructure and a platform that will not be very important for only for broadband but also for the future of evolution in the mobile arena such as the 5G. So to recap, I think that uh, the results we achieve after one year are very important. We have to grow, we have to demonstrate that this model could be viable but I would say that for the ones that are stating that this is not possible, uh, the, the first evidence that we deliver to the market are quite clear in the sense of a confirmation that this model could work. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Elisabetta. Um, I would like to invite Uwe Arm, the CEO of Telia Scanova, um, to do his um, opening presentation, coming from a quite different background, uh, with an originally separated network for 10 years, which is now being reintegrated. So that's a quite interesting story to tell. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I will first uh, give you some background on the Swedish market. We have for at least the last 10 years done a lot of digitization of the infrastructure, the telecom infrastructure in Sweden and it's, it's strongly correlated to the digitization of the society. You can see this in the different rankings. It doesn't matter if it's a network readiness ranking or a society readiness ranking. We are at the top levels in Europe or in the world. I think that's very good, and it's very good for, for the competitiveness of the country in Sweden. We, we need to be very strong in this. Uh, Telia, where I'm part of, we have been a strong part of that digitization. Uh, we have around 37% of the households in Sweden that has access to fiber from us. <coughs> and then we have around 200 more uh, fiber network providers. You will see that later in, in slides. And you shouldn't forget the mobile part. In our mobile network in Sweden, we have 99.99% 4G coverage of the population. I think that's uh, very, very high. Still, we have complaints every week since customer uh, demands that it should be 100%, that 99.99% .99 is not good enough. So they have an extremely strong demand for the customers to be connected all the time. If it's mobile or Wi-Fi or fiber, they don't care. They, they need to be connected all the time. 
<coughs> and what are the success factors for this digitalization in Sweden? It's a strong demand for high-speed broadband, as I told you. We have some uh, different uh, things in Sweden, that is the, the willingness to pay for it also. If we build fiber network, FTTH, the customer pays between 2,000 and 2,500 euros, and they gladly pay that because they have a strong demand for not only broadband, the speed and quality, they want to have fiber. Because the fiber is future-proof and they can relax because the, the house, the home is future-proof. Uh, we have around 60 to 70 percent uptake, the first sales campaign nowadays, on that uh, price level on the connection fee. One reason for that is that the Swedish population has changed the behavior. All the media consumption almost has been changed into the fiber network or the mobile network. That means regular line broadcasting TV, uh, time shifted TV, video on demand, Netflix, whatever. It's to the network. So people actually change the behavior a lot. <coughs> the other one is the, the political will. We have a government that have a very strong uh, ambition here, and, and the target is very high. 95% of the households should have 100 megabit 2020. Today's figures is between 75 and 80% today. 2025, the state at 98% should have one gigabit service. <coughs> and the support is also that they, they will help out in extremely expensive areas. We will get some subsidies. We or the provider that will build a network will have some subsidies from the government or from the local municipality. And that helps out the business case a lot. Secondly, we have a very strong, and I mean healthy, competition. As I said, we have like 200 fiber providers, um, mainly city networks, that have spent uh, at least uh, 4 billion euros the last 20 years to build out fiber network. <coughs> Since the customer would like to have fiber, not only the speed of 100 megabit to 1 gigabit, they would like to have fiber, and they're willing to pay for it, of course, it's a strong competition to be the first player to build fiber. It, it's no, no point getting there as a second provider. So we have been forced in a healthy way to really speed up and, and deploy fiber all over the place. And then we have the copper migration. We have now started 10 years ago almost in, in the rural area in Sweden, closing down the copper network. So far, we have migrated 50,000 customers, but on the rural side, mainly to the mobile network. In some cases, of course, fiber, but, but mainly on the mobile network. And <coughs> these 50,000 customers, that represents 2,000 central offices. So we have so far closed down 2,000 central offices. We are taking decision of another 1,000 central offices the next coming years, and that's public on our web page. In the beginning was a strong debate. If we were allowed, could we do that? What would happen with the customers? But now both the customers and media, politicians, the government support it because it drives digitalization of the society. <coughs> and then back to what you said about the separation. When we started many years ago, we had no separation. The network organization within Telia was one unit on the passive layer and on the active layer. And then 2008, uh, we looked at open reach and did an open reach look alike. Uh, and, and it also had its equal access board and everything. And the reason be because we did that was that uh, we had a very bad situation in the market. There were no trust regarding that. And we had a lot of conflicts and arguments and in courts all the time between the regulator, us, and other operators. So we said voluntarily, we will do a legal separation of the passive network, only copper and fiber network, and, and we will sell the same kind of products internally and externally. <coughs> and we did that uh, in, in, in a good success. We did a lot on M&As. We bought other network providers and small city networks and other companies close to the, to the network layer. And they were not 
really divided into passive and active layer. So they were a, a blend of, of this. So we had a situation where we had a very fragmented situation internally, a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, a lot of internal issues. So we decided uh, that we have to clean up this mess internally. So we have now, this year, 1st of January, formed a new unit that we call Telia Infra that integrates back the Scanova company. So Infra, the new unit, actually handles both the passive layer and the active layer. The, the total fixed network, mobile network, and the cables, and all the sites in Sweden. We still have the ambition, of course, to sell the same products to the other operators, not because we are forced to, but we would like to do that, because it improves our payback times, of course. So we, are, we have told the regulator that we will continue, as before, but in another internal structure. And that new unit, the infra unit, I'm heading that one from now. You also have to understand the Swedish three-layer model. We have at the bottom, we have the infrastructure layer. It used to be Scanova, the, the cables, copper and fiber layers. And then we have also what we call communication operator that puts the active equipment in place and brings a portal to the customer so they can choose a service provider. And if not satisfied, they can choose another service provider but still have the same access, the fiber access. And on top of that, different service provider, of course. So our service provider, Telia, actually sells services on top of our communication operators and on top of other communication operators. And our communication operator, like Cetius, also operates on other fiber networks. So it's more like a complex model with everything is open and a strong competition in all layers. So if you look at the market share, we have different levels of, of market share and different levels, and they are a little bit uh, unique, because if you look at the bottom layer, it's very capital intensive. You have to have certain KPIs and, and business decisions regarding that layer. If you're a service provider, it's a whole another issue how you calculate your business cases. So we are trying to separate the model in different layers instead. All right, I think that was the last slide. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, great. Um, next, um, it is my great pleasure to ask Mike McThay, uh, Chairman of OpenReach, to deliver his opening statement. Thank you very much. Um, when I was thinking about uh, what I would say, given the theme of the, uh, the panel here, I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about um, open reach and uh, get under the surface a little bit as to why it was created in the first place and how it plays a, a, a role in the UK market. Uh, open reach, everybody knows, was created in 2006. Uh, it is the incumbent access network provider uh, in the United Kingdom. But to understand why it was created in 2006, I think you need to go back a little bit in time and understand the, the public and regulatory policy that uh, has operated in the United Kingdom for, in my mind, something like the last 30 to 40 years. And that is this, that the, the, the uh, public policy of successive governments, the regulatory policy of successive regulators in the UK, within the telecoms market has been the presumption that competition, retail, infrastructure, etc., is likely to deliver the best outcomes for the citizens and consumers of the United Kingdom. And that very position, as opposed to other utilities, other sectors, has, I think, informed the way in which the market structure has evolved in the United Kingdom. I could, if I wanted to, go back to the original uh, wireless licenses that were let in the 80s in the UK and talk about the structure of those. I could talk about the way in which the, uh, the regional cable licenses were let in the 80s and 90s. Uh, all of those were about creating some level of, of market competition in the UK and challenging the incumbency of whoever was there at the time, and it was most likely BT. Uh, if you just even fast forward to the last 20 years, we had the local loop unbundling that took place in the UK. The whole idea there was to provide uh, uh, infrastructure-based competition by opening up the 
old BT exchanges and making them accessible to other uh, alternative operators. I was one myself at the time, at Cable and Wires, such that they could offer you know, differentiated broadband services to, to their customers, both business and, um, uh, and uh, 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 retail. If you fast forward to 2003, we had the creation of Ofcom, of which I was a board member for eight very proud years. Uh, and Ofcom continued with the similar approach of, of infrastructure-based competition being at the heart of its, uh, its policy formulation. It, in its first market review of the telecoms market, which took place you know, between then and 2006, it concluded that whilst progress had been made, it needed to see more competition at the retail level, particularly in the UK. That led to the formation of OpenReach. It was a regulatory intervention that basically said, we'd like to see retail level competition. We'd like to see the concept of equivalence introduced with products and services at a wholesale level being available to anybody who wanted to then resell those products to whatever group of customers they saw as their target market. That model uh, worked well for some time. And then in the recent past, which is why I'm standing here in front of you, there was a new agreement reached between Ofcom and, and, um, and OpenReach and BT that gave further independence <coughs> to OpenReach. And that's basically why I'm here. We created an independent company. Uh, it's incorporated. Uh, we have our own independent board of directors, majority of independents. Uh, we're now responsible for setting the, the strategy, the day-to-day -day management, et cetera, of, of OpenReach itself. And we think very much of BT in two distinct ways. We think of BT very much as a shareholder, which we need to respect. And we also think of the lines of business within BT as customers in the same way as we think of all of our other 590 customers that we have today. That's a big change. We've implemented that this year. Um, more recent manifestations of that change are the very fact that I'm standing here and it's not a BT person. Um, I think this is now the second or third occasion that, uh, that OpenReach has been is representing itself in public forums like this and indeed is making responses to regulatory consultations. Um, and then more recently, uh, you've seen our announcement on uh, uh, the deployment of FTTP, as we call it, fiber to the home, um, where we have announced that we will be building out three million uh, total homes past between now and, and 2020, building upon where we are today. Those programs, or that particular program, was the outcome of the OpenReach board and the consultation that it conducted last year, starting last July, and led to uh, us going to the shareholder, to BT, to get board approval for that a couple of weeks ago, and then we got their approval and announced it. So, what are the things I'm saying here? In the UK market, at least, I think you know, OpenReach was the first scale wholesaler. OpenReach was created because of public policy and regulatory intervention. It would not have been created that way. And I think that regulatory intervention has delivered tremendous outcomes for the UK. So OpenReach, we've, you know, this year alone, we'll invest about one and a half billion of CapEx into, into uh, our market. We have cumulatively spent 11 plus billion in the last 10 years. We have increased the rate of CapEx uh, for the coming years. Uh, as we build out the fiber network. Um, we have delivered, I think, pretty good outcomes for the UK. If you look at the, you know, the, uh, the coverage that exists, total homes and premises passed, it's now up at 95% for super fast. If you look at the uh, penetrations that we have, 44% of that 95%, you know, buy and take that product. And if you look at the price, so I would love to have the economics, um, of my Swedish colleague here, if you look at the price at which the consumers pay in the UK, it's extraordinarily competitive and right up there with uh, the, the, the best in the marketplace. So 
from my point of view, I think those interventions successively over a 20, 30 year period have proven the case that, that competition does work, that creating a wholesale market does and can work, uh, and that you need to have regular oversight of how that market functions to ensure that it continues to provide the outcomes that you need it to provide. So it is, at least in the UK, the wholesale market, I think, is contingent upon the right public policy, the right regulatory policy, and then the right structures in the industry itself. And I think that OpenReach is, is very, very much living up to that. I'll close with what our priorities are, and then we can uh, listen to, hear from Greg, and then get into the discussion itself. But priorities we have really are twofold as the incumbent. I said earlier, uh, and took some pride in the fact that we have 95% super fast coverage in the UK at the moment, of which around 87% is provided by OpenReach. Okay, that's great, but what about the other 5%? So we're very focused on trying to figure out ways to deal with uh, that residue of the UK population that does not have access to decent broadband. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the programs that uh, government and, and, and others have, have put in place, things like BD UK, things like uh, perhaps R100 in Scotland, we expect that number to halve as a result of those programs in the coming two to three years. But that will still leave, in my mind, half a million homes in the UK that, that we have to do something about. And yes, the government has introduced you know, a, a backstop statutory USO on-demand product, but I know it, that's going to take two or three years to implement, and it's going to be somewhat unsatisfactory during that period and afterwards for those poor consumers that don't have access to it. So we have to find a solution to that. And, we, and I think that's an industry issue, and I think, well, I can speak for ourselves, we've engaged with, with the regulator and with government on how we might solve that. Our second priority is to make the flip to fiber. So that's probably why I'm invited here. We don't appear on your charts or anything like that. We have very, very, very low fiber uh, penetration in the UK at the moment. That's full fiber. We've made the, 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 the trick uh, uh, was in the announcement that we made. It's more in the announcement than the, uh, the, the numbers themselves. So, you know, fiber first is absolutely the way now OpenReach is thinking about the world. So in any, it is a presumption in our minds that we will fiber first. I think that's a really important thing for people to take away. And if we, only if we can't, for whatever reason, will we fall back onto, um, onto the copper estate. We still have to manage the copper estate because we don't have the benefit or privilege of not having that. And it's still providing fantastic service and decent broadband speeds to the vast majority of the United Kingdom. But we have crossed that Rubicon. We have decided we're going to make the investment, we're going to compete, just like the markets have been structured in the past, and we're going to deploy fiber uh, as quickly as we can. And I think the, you know, the program itself is to get up to about a million, million plus homes or premises pass per year. Those are our two priorities. We mustn't lose sight of either. We can't have have-nots and then gigabit speeds over here. We have to deal with the have-nots, and we have to, as an industry, stand up to that and, and, and face into it. But at the same time, we also have to make the investment that we think is necessary to keep uh, the UK the leading economy in the G20 from a digital point of view. Those are my opening remarks. I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mike and um, uh, Greg. <laughs> and last but not least, it's my great pleasure to invite Greg Mash, uh, the CEO of City Fiber, the very newest member of the FTTH Council Europe, uh, to join us on stage and deliver well, his opening well, remarks. Thank you. And, and by the way, first of all, thank you and the FTTH Council, because I've been a huge follower and, and um, been coming to them for years and years and years. Um, I mean, City Fiber, a lot don't realize we are over seven years old. We've been working at this for a long time. It, did, it didn't just come about. Um, and before I, I go on to that slide, it's going into automatic mode. How do I stop that? It must, that's how fast we go. That's part of, <laughs> one of one of our whole themes is speed. Speed is a weapon. Um, and you can see what the problem is. Um, 
However, before I go into that, I do want to thank uh, everybody out here for taking your Valentine's Day away. And I do want a picture of this so I can send to my wife to show that I'm with a whole bunch of old white males. <laughs> there is no diversity in this industry yet. And uh, having young daughters, I need to change that. Anyway, City Fiber is publicly traded. We are on the London Stock Exchange. We are um, uh, seven years old. We're open access wholesale provider. Um, we are a catalyst for change. We believe we're the spark. We believe that the open reach announcement two weeks ago was a result of us. We believe that the announcement from Talk Talk about wanting to do fiber was a result of us. We do believe that it's the challenger, it's the new, it's the, it's the, the group that challenges the status quo that makes the change, and we believe we're that agent in the UK, and we've been doing it for quite a while. We have done a little bit of a unique strategy in that we focused on the secondary cities, all the cities outside of the M25. Uh, there's roughly 100 of those cities. Those 100 cities make up 40% of all the homes, 60% of the business population, and it's 40% of the UK GDP and the fifth largest economy in the world, and there's no super high-quality digital infrastructure. And if you want to compete on your own around this world, Brexit is a good example, then you better have the finest digital infrastructure you can because you're going alone. And a service-based economy, let's realize, the United Kingdom's a service-based economy. Service-based economies run on the internet, and the internet runs on fiber. So we need to get fiber into every premise, home and business, as fast as we can. And our strategy has been to go across those secondary cities. So over the last um, rough seven years, we've done a little bit of an interesting strategy. We use public sector procurements is a way where we can build the core infrastructure in those cities. And we don't really concentrate on fiber cable. We concentrate on duct infrastructure. I want hundreds of kilometers of duct infrastructure in each city. Because then I'll subduct it four or five ways, and we'll run fiber cables in there so we can actually connect every single person in that, in that city. So we've done five duct and infrastructure acquisitions. We've done nine metro, qual metro builds. We're across 42 cities today. They're not little cities. So we have 150 kilometers in Edinburgh. We have enough subduct and duct capacity to connect every single home and business and cell site and traffic light and small cell in that city. So what we're concentrating is building a core infrastructure in those cities that can, is capable of powering those cities for the next 100 years. And we believe whatever success we have will make the whole industry better, and it'll make UK better, and it'll make Talk Talk better, it'll make Sky better, and it'll make BT better. So we believe in competition at its roots, and we believe that we're the change agent of that. We've raised over 500 million pounds. That's hard from a company from a startup. I did it as a pound acquisition seven years ago. I have been building infrastructure in Europe for going on almost 25 years in four different countries, so this isn't new. But it's hard to raise capital and put it into models. Every single project we do comes with a contract back. Its contract back throws off yield. And we are what we like to think of ourselves as a yield generating machine. Now, we we're, have a goal, and we will just to touch on that a minute, because we want to get across 20% of the UK. We believe that if we exist, and we can demonstrate what we're saying we can do, which is build faster, quicker, leaner, meaner than anybody else in the UK, it will result in a lower wholesale price than anybody can offer. It will drive the whole industry to move faster, quicker, leaner, and cheaper. It will bring prices down from open reach, it'll bring prices down for everybody, and the ultimate consumer will end up getting what we demonstrated in York, gigabit speeds for 25 pounds a month, because we believe that's where the future is. Now we use a concept called the well-planned city design, so every time we go into a city, we look at reorganizing that duct infrastructure, that subduct infrastructure, because it's all about ducts to us underground civil engineering. And to be, to be real honest, I would, I, would, I would like City Fiber to be 300 all engineers, because I'm an engineer at heart, I'm an engineer by graduate, uh, and we definitely need half of them to be women. So that is, our, that is our drive. Now, just looking at our model real quick, we do not do it for homes, we do not do it for mobile, we do not do it for business, we do not do it for public sector, we do it for the city. And we do it for all the consumers across that city. 
So our initial Metrolink or contract comes in, we build that infrastructure, but we design it so that all <coughs> business parks, all business central districts get served. We design it so we know where all the macro sites are. So all the macro sites from all the base stations, from all the mobile operators, we map them out, we put them on there. And then we design it and route it so that we can drop cabinets off for fiber to the home at any time we want. And that was what we did with that trial in, in New York, is we, we showed that you can take and leverage a core infrastructure if designed right, and you can leverage it right into a reduced cost per home, which results in a wholesale rate that's equal, roughly, to the fiber to the cabinet rate. And that's the beauty. We can actually sell fiber lines to, at a wholesale level equal to the fiber to the cabinet pricing that BT Wholesale does or, or OpenReach does. Now, we just executed a real strategic contract for us. Some people said, geez, Greg, that must have taken you a while. That was like six months of negotiation. I said, no, it was seven years. <laughs> Took us seven years because it had to prove our model, it had to prove our economics, it had to prove that we could do it, it had to prove that we were a supplier. What it is, though, is the, it's, a, it's an ability to, that can scale across roughly 50 cities, 20% of the UK. No less than 12 cities and a million homes, so we're on that now. And when we say we're deploying and building a city, we're building the entire city. We're not cherry picking. We're not doing little sections. Milton Keynes was announced. It's 80,000 premises, we'll all get fiber. It's 40 million pounds, it's committed, construction company moving. And we'll do that through a whole series of announcements this year. That delivers roughly 50% of the government's full fiber target. Um, and we're committed to an open access model. So all of our services are open to BT Retail, Sky, TalkTalk, Talk, anybody that wants to use them. We have given a little bit of a period of exclusivity to Vodafone, but we did that in exchange for them anchoring, committing to a minimum volume commitment of 20% for over 20 years, which the formula was what we were proving, was that will anchor in infrastructure capital at low interest rates. So that's what we're working on now. So we're in that position where I think we're in a leading position to keep driving that and to prove those economics, and we're doing it at a city by city by city basis. We also think that the only way to really get those socioeconomics and creativity and innovation is having the whole city provide not a little pocket over here of a new home building or a little pocket over there where nobody understands where it is, but have the whole city available with gigabit speeds at a fraction of the cost. Now, obviously, you have, this is the chart everybody hates to look at, but realizes we need to put fiber into every single building. In my view, fiber should be in every single building, home or business, should be in every cell site, every small site. That is obvious. The next 100 years, we're, the, the, the quality of our digital infrastructure is directly going to affect our quality of life and our productivity in businesses, and we just need to get on and do it. Now, what our vision really is, is that we believe that the best answer for this is not the incumbent infrastructures. It's just not. They have a role to play, but it's not theirs to own. The legacy assets and their legacy systems get in the way. They don't accelerate them. The concept that I have a whole bunch of junk in the ground and that I can make it go faster is completely fallacy. We don't touch anything when we put a new network in. It's all fresh build. We don't worry about plugging into old systems. We don't worry about knocking off some old copper. We don't worry about displacing revenues from all of that. So we think it's, it's really incumbent upon, I use that word incumbent upon, actually the governments and the, and the regulators to look at I have to have a change agent. I have to have somebody in my country that demonstrates true economics, speed, and efficiency, because that's what will drive my incumbent on his other 80% of the country. So we feel strongly about having a, a, a change agent like ourselves in e each country. Uh, we're not depending on in, any incremental revenues, obviously. We are, we are taking no revenues, and we're taking the revenue base that is already there and shifting it off. That's hence why I don't need incremental revenues. I need the same revenues that actually you're paying today to an open reach for, for their wholesale prices. So proven whole model builds, I think, is the answer. We believe we can do it faster. We did it faster twice. Um, we can do it faster, quicker, and the, and the benefits are that is the lower cost to the consumers. So we really believe in the change, and if you don't believe that somebody fresh can disrupt an old, old environment, then must, we must not have just watched 
four times the largest payload than anybody's ever lifted at 20% of the cost. And NASA said for five years it couldn't be done. That's what City Fiber views itself about. We think we can do it twice as quick at half the price, and we can do it for at least 20% of the UK. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, and thank you to all of you for his very interesting opening remarks. Um, I do have some follow-up questions, and um, I would like to address um, first Sean um, as the first speaker. Um, Sean, you, you have described to us um, CSIRO as basically a joint venture between the utility, a state-owned utility, and Vodafone. Um, I wonder why utility, a state-owned at that, is entering the broadband business in Ireland, where there is already a somewhat established broadband market, not a fiber market. <laughs> um, well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, if the utility, obviously, it, it, the similarities are, are fairly plain in terms of it is a ultimately a wires business, the electrical utility, uh, and they do have the the legacy um, network on the electrical network that, with a connection to every home. So the ability to leverage off that is key, um, and you will find actually that most electrical utilities have a fair degree of fibre experience, mm. telecoms experience, uh, whether they whether in the case of ESB, they had rolled out some fiber on the transmission system to, you know, to provide some backbone, backhaul services into the country already, or they typically use it for their own control um, sort of, uh, uh, and safety um, systems. So there's a lot of fiber crossover into electric, electrical utilities anyway. But in terms of the Irish um, situation, uh, as I think I alluded to, was that you know, the, the utility looked and said, well, where can we invest? And then, uh, you know, they did look at Irish water and all the other opportunities as well. But the broadband sector was one that was crying out for investment at the time. Mm. Um, I said there'd been, there'd been uh, you know, significant underinvestment for over a decade uh, and the broadband speeds in regional Ireland. And it's not unlike Greg said there, if you look outside the major cities, the regional towns, mm. even though the, the scale of them is different in Ireland, had been particularly poorly served. So the opportunity was there, and there was a lot of trials done by them to say, could it be done feasibly? First thing, can it be done safely? Can it be done feasibly putting it up on an electrical system that wasn't designed for uh, a fiber connection? Um, and once that work was done, then uh, you know, the, uh, rolling out the commercials and then seeking a partner to do it. Um, so I think it ultimately, and from an ESB point of view in the Irish case, it was, can it be done? Can we leverage off our existing assets, make a commercial return? Um, bring in, they brought in a partner to bring in some global innovative mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, you know, technological expertise in the telecom sector um, and, and then just sort of bring it out. But there was also the underlying piece very much at the heart of what sort of the, the utility felt, which had previously done rural electrification, which was sort of mm -hmm. the last big infrastructure rollout in Ireland, mm -hmm. was that there was a piece here that they were delivering for Ireland Inc., that there was a need. Um, at a social level uh, as well um, that drove not just the pure commercial exploitation of and leveraging off their existing assets. Thank you. Um, Elisabetta, um, open fiber has similarities actually with, with CSIRO. You also have a utility parent. You are also a wholesale only operator. And I would like to ask you about the wholesale only business model, the business model of choice. I wonder whether you you see it as sort of um, um, a democratic business model in the sense that you're open to cater for anybody who wishes to use your network, but also if you could elaborate on the element of covering not only cities, but quite deliberately also covering rural areas so that you don't leave anybody behind. Yeah, you're right. We have a uh, very few similarity with uh, with them. Even if we do not have uh, an operator in our shareholding structure, it means that we are wholesale uh, uh, only and we are uh, open to all uh, um, potential customers, uh, starting from Vodafone, that by the way is one, uh, one of our customers, but all the others players, as I mentioned before, and we are very, very interesting in uh, 
enabling also operators or players that are not traditionally uh, telco operator because this is the way we have to enlarge the offer and the option for the market. But um, we also uh, look at the opportunity coming from the specific situation of the country. I mean, Italy, uh, for the ones that have visited, it's clear is a country where average is not exactly the right way to understanding uh, population distribution of the population because uh, we are uh, the country where uh, basically the uh, one third of population lives in uh, uh, small cities lives uh, in uh, the uh, neighborhoods of large cities and in those areas we had uh, and we have still but we are working on that a digital divide so our intention is not to be a no-profit organization for sure we are not going to look for areas where the return on investments uh, is not uh, assured but we think that there is the opportunity of offering fiber um, to the areas where Due to the fact that the incumbent has different priorities, there is a, a significant digital divide. So when I look at the, the numbers and I consider that uh, penetration of broadband is in the region of 75% at national level and I divide it into different areas, I realize that we are in the region of 85% in large cities, so we are at the level of the European bench but we are at, in the region of 50% of penetration in uh, certain areas. So we think that there, there we have an opportunity because we can go with our solution and we can be the first. And being the first mover in the broadband is really uh, the key uh, success factor considering that when you deliver fiber and FTTH, churn is very low. So for us, it's a great opportunity. On top of that, we receive also, as I mentioned, the support of our uh, government uh, in the framework of the digital agenda, so we can share the burden of these investments. And this results in a very, let me say, win-win business case, not only for the country, but also for us and our shareholders. Thank you. Um, turning to Uwe, um, Uwe, actually, you're, you're, you're doing the opposite almost as OpenReach. So OpenReach has deepened its separation, um, and now Telia is, after 10 years of separation, is reintegrating its network infrastructure into the vertically integrated business. Could you please share with us some insights on what is really the rationale behind <coughs> the reintegration and going exactly the opposite way as some of the other operators? Well, uh, I think uh, the main reason uh, is that we need to improve our internal efficiency. Uh, and we saw that when we did a lot of uh, M&As in different companies that were not structured the, the, the our way, we have to do something about it. And uh, we, we need to actually take away a lot of time-consuming discussions internally. The trick is to really to do that, at the same time keep the, the wholesale customers, the other operators happy. And, but we have changed the, the market situation in Sweden in the last 10 years. Uh, before we had a lot of conflicts, as I said. Now we have business relations with other operators <coughs> and have good discussions with them. And we are eager to have them as customers because they are helping us to invest in a network, and if you're building an expensive network with a lot of capex, of course, we need to have all the customers in that network. It doesn't matter what kind of service provider they choose. So we need to take all the traffic, all the revenues in into our network. So if we can really prove in, in action now that we are actually doing that, and the other operators are happy, and uh, the regulator has no opinion, so, so as long as we behave on the market, so, so I think uh, for us it's uh, like a normal next step. So we have left behind the years of conflicts in Sweden. Still we have some arguments, but more like business arguments. So I think we're on a good journey. 
this is, I find this really quite fascinating and, and also <coughs> kind of turning next to, to Mike. Um, Mike has mentioned um, in his opening statement that we are creatures of regulation. So I wonder whether you might wish to elaborate on really how do you see the role of regulation and how should the, the role of regulation play out in defining or shaping business models and also um, certainly the EU has a given regulatory framework which is mm. shifting but not entirely changing. So how would you see this work out, let's say, over the next 10 to 20 years? What type of business models and industry structure would you foresee if you had a crystal ball here? <laughs> Whoa. Um, okay, it's an excellent question. Uh, the, I think what's been very interesting to listen to the panel people here is there's no one solution, right? I mean, it's fascinating to hear the different, different implementations in different countries and territories and so forth. But from a, a UK point of view, I think the, the, uh, the die has been cast, and that is that, you know, the, the market model uh, that has been, um, uh, I think, encouraged by public policy, regulatory policy, has been one of, of comp competition. Uh, that model typically then leads you to, you know, um, what I call, uh, what, well, what in the jargon is called ex post regulation. In other words, that you allow competition to, to, to flourish and then you monitor that from a performance behavioral point of view and to the extent you then find market failure or th things of that nature, you intervene at that point after the fact, basically. Um, that has led to some great outcomes. But it, 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 you know, like any model, it has its pros and cons. And the big balance, I think, that we are now approaching is you, you, you can use the model to influence things like uh, level of competition, uh, number of, 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 of parties, the competitiveness of the products and stuff like that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you can also uh, have a chilling effect on investment or not, depending upon you know, how, you, how you sort of turn that tap. So, you know, that, 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 that's, that's just the model that we have in the UK. If you look at some of the other utilities, you have what's called the market plan, you know, ex-ante model, right? Where basically you, you appoint regional designated providers, be it water, be it electricity or whatever. Uh, some are national, some are regional. There are lots of different models. But the objective being that you sit down with that provider, you make a, a plan, you agree their investments, you create incentives for them to make or not make those, you know, those investments, and you, you kind of you know, socialize the costs of the haves and have, you know, of serving the haves and have nots by effectively having regional or national pricing or wh whatever takes its place. Uh, whether that kind of model can actually has a role in accelerating uh, you know, the uh, deployment of next generation networks like FTTP in the UK, I'm not sure. I'm not mm -hmm. sure whether that ship has totally sailed. But given the level of investment that everybody has to make in the UK over the coming period, it might be worth having a little think as to whether, that, you know, whether there's any merit in that model. But right now we're charging down the, you know, the, uh, the 20 or 30 year public policy model of competition. Thank you. Looking at your competitor um, and the UK market. Competitor, competitor, competitor. <laughs> competitor. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Greg, um, obviously you, you do not have a legacy fiber network. So really, how do you see the fiber investment case and business case to differ for you as a new player um, compared to um, an operator that owns a legacy copper network and also how do you see the role um, of copper switch-off in the equation? Oh, well, I think you meant I don't have a legacy copper network. We do. We are a pure fiber network. So um, I think it's an advantage for us. I think the, the copper uh, incumbents, the copper incumbents are stuck be between legacy systems, legacy assets. I mean, we have 300 people. We build whole cities. I've built a whole city out. I've built 14,000 homes. We have fault rates that are one one hundredth of a copper net network. It's, it's, it's proven. It's, it, it's just more efficient. It's easier. It's faster. It's quicker. It's better. Um, so we're not, then that is the beauty. I mean, I to all due respect, and I have great respect for what BT and BT OpenReach have done for the UK, but th they've created an environment where it's flourishing retail 
competition, but not infrastructure competition. There's one and a half infrastructures across the UK. There's Virgin across 50% and open reach across everything. So, so you need an infrastructure competition. Um, not having the legacy copper makes this really fast and quick and cheap, and it, and it works, it runs. Um, and, and we proved it again and again and again and again, and we'll continue to prove it. The, the beauty of it is, is that we're a yield machine. Um, we have never built any, any, any fiber networks on risk. Every one of our fiber networks that we build throws off a yield. Our target yield is almost 20%. We don't do projects that don't throw off yields of 10. The reason that the energy companies and utility companies are jumping into the fiber space is we throw off better yields mm -hmm. than the regulated utility space. And we throw off tremendous yields. Now the copper switchover is a fantastic thing. We're putting 40 million pounds into Milton Keynes right now doing 80,000 pr premises. If there's a copper switchover, I'd like to switch over all that copper and all those revenues onto my fiber network. And all 12 cities that we're building right now, and we're putting half a billion pounds of commitment to them, I'd like all the revenue that's in there also to be switched over to my network. So as long as the copper switchover is fair, then let's switch it all off. But let's don't switch it off just for the benefit of one. Let's switch it off for the benefit of all. So I, I just don't see it happening. I think that's the problem with the incumbent right now, and I don't think it's going away. And here's the problem, he's going to run two networks for a long time. Hence, he needs an incremental return on that investment. Hence, the price for the consumer is twice what we can deliver it for. And that's just not going away. P pure economics are proving. The reason Vodafone signed a deal with us, they made it very clear, two reasons. One, I can't conceive of a situation where the UK goes back to a monopoly provider for fiber. So I need the help. Two, City Fiber is offering me fiber lines at half the price of BT OpenReach. If that model works, the UK is better off all the way around because everybody else will have to respond, be more efficient. We don't need 3,000 new workers. For God's sake, that's the last thing I want. Um, so I think the whole copper switchover is a perfect, perfect, perfect analogy. It's not going to happen. And if it happens, it should happen to each of us equally. Thank you very much. <laughs> Which I think kind of demonstrates that however boring the copper switch of issue and the, the, the managing process of the migration might sound, this is a real <coughs> crucial element, I think, in actually making fiber successfully happen all across Europe for the benefit um, of everyone. And I think it is perhaps worth having more discussion on this uh, intrinsically kind of boring sounding topic because it, it has just such a great importance. Um, we are almost entirely out of time for this session. So I wonder there is perhaps one question um, from the audience that uh, one of our panelists could respond to. Any questions from anybody? I see one question there, so we will just say that one question. I'd actually just be really interested to hear what Mike's could you response please, um, is. Oh, sorry. Sorry, could you please introduce yourself and sorry. state your affiliation as well? I'm Adrian Worcester. I work for GigaClear in the UK. I'd be really interested to hear Mike's response to Greg's copper switch off comments, actually, just to see whether we can come to an accommodation on a, an even handed switch off. <laughs> Yes, yes, I think it's okay. So my answer is that uh, that decision, I, I actually don't own those customers. That decision will be a decision for Sky, Talk, Talk, mm -hmm. and all the other CPs that we work mm -hmm. with. My job is to give them products and services at a wholesale level that they want to continue to consume, mm -hmm. and I will work very hard for them to stay on my wholesale network. But ultimately, it will be for my communication <coughs> provider customers to make that decision. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our wonderful panelists for this hugely interesting discussion. Let's send them in the traditional way. <laughs>